The Golden Bowl, A Mesopotamian Adventure by Marjorie Cowley, read by Brian Henderson. This recording is made for educational purposes only. All rights reserved to the author and publishers. Chapter 1. Changes The drought had lasted for months. Jomar dug for edible roots in the dry, sandy soil, but found only three small, misshapen carrots that once he would have given to the pigs. He glanced up at the squawking blackbirds as they flew high above him. When he was younger, it had been his job to wave his arms and yell at the birds to scare them off before they ate the precious barley seeds. Now, they no longer swooped down to pick at the brown and brittle grain. Jomar stopped digging when he heard the bellowing of a cow. He had promised his father to help with the birthing of her calf. As he ran across the scorched fields towards the cow shed, the rocky soil cut into his frayed leather sandals. The entire region was so barren that it was hard for Jomar to recall that all the farms in the area had once produced abundant grain, melons and grapes, plums and pears, cabbage and carrots. Gazelle and other wild animals had once been plentiful, attracted to the crops and to the water in the irrigation canals that cut through the countryside. Now the canals were empty, and the farm looked as if nothing had ever grown in the sun-baked land that stretched around him. Jomar heard his younger sister Zephyr singing as he passed the goat hutch. As she sang, she strummed on a small wooden lyre, a stringed instrument he'd made for her when she was a little girl. Veering from the path to the cowshed, Jomar darted into the hutch. Zephyr sat on an overturned bucket, so intent on her song that she didn't look up at him. Squinting into the shadows, he saw that Zephyr's eyes glistened like pieces of glassy black obsidian as she began a song to Nana, the mighty moon god. Moon glowing Nana, all-knowing Nana, look down from the heavens and pity us. Jomar broke in. Pity? What pity? Why make up a song to the moon god when he lets his people go hungry? He didn't wait for an answer. And don't let father hear this sad song. He's worried enough as it is. He turned to leave the hutch. Wait, Zephyr said. I'm in here so he won't hear me, but you should listen. This will be the last time you'll hear my music. He stared at her and realized why her eyes glistened. They were filled with tears. What do you mean? Why are you crying? Zephyr gave her news haltingly. I heard father talking to mother last night. They thought I was asleep. Tomorrow, he's sending you away, to the city, to live in Ur. Jomar's breath went out of him. I don't believe this. You're sure? There's not enough food for us all, Zephyr said. Haven't you noticed they're growing weaker? Yes, I've noticed, Jomar said. But he knew he had been pushing this knowledge away. Too full of hurt and anger to talk further, and aching to escape from his sister's sad eyes, Jomar abruptly left the hutch. His mouth was dry. He could feel his heart pounding. Where would he live in the city? What would he do there? Farming was all he knew, and all he wanted to know. Trying to calm himself, Jomar looked out across the flat fields and saw the massive mud brick temple of Ur looming in the distance like a mountain. Nana, the powerful moon god of Ur, lived in the temple. Jomar had grown up feeling protected by him, but now he felt abandoned by Nana, and by his father. Again, he heard the bellowing of the cow. Again, he'd forgotten his promise to help with the birth of her calf. He started running, but, but dread as well as hunger made his stomach tighten with cramps. Because of the drought, two boys his age who lived in surrounding farms had been sold into slavery in exchange for food. Would my father do that to me? It was unthinkable, but he could think of nothing else as he raced towards the cow shed. Chapter 2 Hard times. Jomar burst into the shed and found his father, Durabi, kneeling over a newborn calf, struggling to free itself from its birthing from its birth pouch. The birthing was hard. The little one's so weak, his father said. It must be released from its pouch so it can nurse. Durabi handed Jomar his knife, sat back on his heels, and stared at his son with dull eyes. Jomar took the knife and cut open the pouch that imprisoned the calf. He brought the newborn to its feet stroking the small, slippery creature that had somehow survived its difficult delivery. Then Jomar lifted the calf to its mother, but it was so wobbly that he had to put his arms around its body to keep it from falling. 
the cow turned to lick her offspring as it nursed. Jomar saw his father watching him, his face creased with care. Was his father worried about the calf, their last cow, so thin that her ribs could be counted, or was he worried about him? Jomar raised his chin and blurted out his concern. Zephyr said you're sending me away to the city. This can't be true. His father winced, but the silence in the hot shed was broken only by the noise of the newborn calf's weak suckling. Father, speak to me, Jomar persisted. I'm needed here. The farm grows nothing, Durabi said bitterly. Our barley is gone, and the only wheat left is Emmer. He picked up some of the hard, reddish grain on the floor and let it slip through his fingers. We planted this to feed our animals. Now it feeds us. Yes, I know, but... Durabi continued as if he hadn't heard. Our pigs and sheep are gone, taken by the temple, traded for barley, or slaughtered to keep us alive. He pointed to Jomar's worn sandals and shook his head. Without hide, I can't even make you a new pair. Father, listen, I know nothing but farming. What will I do in the city? I haven't told you this because I prayed that the snows would melt. He faltered, then gathered his strength. The last time I was in Ur, to give my last two pigs to the temple, I stopped at a, at a bazaar to eat my midday meal. There, I met a man named Sita, a goldsmith who works for the temple. We talked. I told him I feared I would have to send you to the city to survive because of desperate conditions on the farm. He told me his only child, a son about your age, had recently died. Sita and I made an agreement. Again, he stopped speaking and looked away. You will be his new apprentice. I have no interest in being a goldsmith's apprentice. Jomar's throat closed up and his words came out in a whisper. Will I be his slave? He'll take you into his house and teach you his skills. But I didn't sell you to him, Durabi said. How could I do this to you? Or to your sister? Jomar stared at his father. Zepha? She must go with you, Durabi said. She grows too thin and her hair has lost its luster. This isn't fair. How can I learn new skills and look after her at the same time? You can't, Durabi answered. She must have her own work. And what would that be? Jomar asked in a challenging tone that he had never used with his father before. Durabi bit off his words. I made no arrangements for her because I had no thought of sending her away. You're 14. Soon you'll be a man. Zeppa will be your responsibility. Jomar felt his stomach hollow out. I beg you, father, let us both stay. The snows will melt, the river will run full again, and the canals and reservoirs will fill with water. Then you'll need me to help with the replanting. Mother will need Zephyr to help her with chores. Jarabi shook his head sadly, his anger drained out of him. I can't wait any longer. I must act before you and Zephyr weaken. The arrangement I made for you with the goldsmith is good. Early tomorrow, I'll take you to the broad, well-traveled road that leads to the city. You must stay on it until you get to the great gate of Ur. You're not taking us all the way, Jomar's, Jomar asked, embarrassed by the catch in his voice. That was my first thought, but your mother's too weak for me to leave her for that long a time, Durabi said. She's been giving you and Zephyr most of her food, pretending that she's eaten earlier or will eat later. Jomar's anger lifted as he listened to his father's words and saw his sorrowful expression. When did you make your decision to send Zephyr to the city? He asked softly. Only yesterday afternoon, when I found our last two goats dead of starvation in the far field, Durabi said. They were nothing but bones, their hair matted and coarse. I thought of Zephyr's hair, how it used to shine. He let the words fade away. The calf stopped nursing and made small, plaintive noises. There was no more milk. The cow bent her scrawny neck to lick her newborn calf again. Jomar felt his future was as shaky as the calf's. He was certain of only one thing. He would not be here to find out if this small, struggling creature lived or died. Chapter 3. Preparations Jomar turned restlessly on his narrow cot throughout the hot night. He felt the gritty sting of sand that had drifted into the house in spite of his mother's unending efforts to sweep it out. How completely his life would change when the darkness lightened into dawn. Not only was he being forced to leave, but in the city he would have the heavy burden of caring for Zephyr. Jomar must have finally dozed because the familiar scent of sesame woke him. His mother came in carrying a lamp that burned the pungent oil made from crushed sesame seeds. My son, my son, Leland crooned, 
putting down the lamp and kneeling beside his bed. I never wanted this to happen to you, to Zeppa, she said, burying her face in his hands. I know you didn't, Jomar said, taking her hands away from her thin, lined face and holding them in his own. Has Zeppa found out what's going to happen to her? I took her up to the roof last evening to tell her, Leland said. She cried in my arms like a toddling child through half the night. Oh, Jomar, help her. Her strong spirit has fled. I don't think she'll let me help her. She's always gone to you when she's needed comforting. Jomar stopped talking as Zephyr came down the ladder from the roof. Rumpled and red-eyed, she stared suddenly at Jomar as if this upheaval were his fault. Leland stood up and brushed the tears from her eyes. The journey to the city will take a full day. You must leave soon or so you'll have some cool walking time before sunrise. She brought out two reed traveling baskets. Both of you have a change of clothing and what food I could give you. You must make it last until you get to Ur. Durabi appeared in the low doorway. I've come from the cow shed. The little one is weak and needs more milk than its mother can give it, but it survived the night. Good news, father, Jomar said, then busied himself attaching his basket to his back and adjusting its leather straps. Zephyr rummaged in her basket. My liar isn't here, Leland patted her arm. I didn't want to burden you with anything unnecessary. Your basket's heavy enough, Jomar said, thinking that he would have to shoulder it along with his own when Zepha got tired. But Zepha spoke slowly, emphasizing each word. I want my lyre. Leland stroked her daughter's face, then added the instrument to Zepha's belongings. When she hung the basket from Zepha's thin shoulders, her mother received the glimmering of a smile. Jomar received an angry look. Darabi turned to Jomar. I've heard a guard has been stationed at the city gate during these troubled times. When he asks your reason for entering the city, tell them you are to be apprenticed to Sita, a temple goldsmith. You're working for a goldsmith? Zephyr asked wide-eyed. What will I do? Work will be found for you, Darabi said quickly, then turned to Jomar. Sita told me that his house is on a street in the back of the temple where craftsmen live. When you find him, present yourself as the son of Darabi. And Zephyr, Jomar asked. I told you what your responsibilities are, his father said. When Jomar frowned, Zephyr glared at him with narrowed eyes. Go, while it's still cool, Leland said. Now openly weeping, she drew her children to her and touched each of their faces tenderly. We do this for you, only for you. Darabi patted his wife's shoulder. I'll return as soon as I can. Jomar, Zephyr, and their father went out through the low doorway into the still dark morning. They could hear Leland's soft, insistent crying as they walked away from the farmhouse. Finally, the only sound heard was the slap-slap of their sandals on the hard, dry ground.